The scripture reading this morning will be from 1 Chronicles chapter 15, verses 1 through 3 and 12 through 16. It'll be page 475, if I remember correctly, in the Pew Bibles. David built houses for himself in the city of David, and he prepared a place for the ark of God and pitched a tent for it. Then David said, No one may carry the ark of God but the Levites, for the Lord has chosen them to carry the ark of God and to minister before him forever. And David gathered all Israel together at Jerusalem to bring up the ark of the Lord to its place, which he had prepared for it. He said to them, You are the heads of the fathers' houses of the Levites. Sanctify yourselves, you and your brethren, that you may bring up the ark of the Lord God of Israel to the place I have prepared for it. For because you did not do it the first time, the Lord our God broke out against us because we did not consult him about the proper order. So the Pharisees and the Levites sanctified themselves to bring up the ark of the Lord God of Israel. And the children of the Levites bore the ark of God on their shoulders by its poles as Moses had commanded according to the word of the Lord. Then David spoke to the leaders of the Levites to appoint their brethren to be singers, accompanied by instruments of music, stringed instruments, harps, cymbals, by raising the voice with a resounding joy. You may be seated. It's a beautiful day, and we are thrilled to have everyone here, especially our guests. If you have been away for a while and you have come back, we are honored that you have found your way back to the South Trail Church of Christ. We hope that you'll come back and worship with us week after week. Uh, if we say or do anything that you have a question about, we would love to be able to open up the Bible and give you an answer for not only the hope that we have, but the understanding of what Scripture teaches uh, that we have as well. So we're thrilled that you're here. Uh, I am going to attempt to use the PowerPoint this morning, and so hopefully this will go smoothly. But if it doesn't, then just roll with me with it, all right? Uh, we'll, we will get uh, uh, used to this a little bit more. Uh, I heard about two hunters that went out and they got lost. And so the first hunter had an idea that the best thing they could do was to shoot three times in the air and someone would come and rescue them. So they did that, and they waited. There was no response. They did it a second time, and still no one came. Finally, the second hunter looked at the first, and he said, Well, we can try it again, but I want you to know that after this time, we're down to three arrows. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Dan. I appreciate that. <laughs> Over the holidays, Gwen and I were watching some romance movies, and I'm just going to give you gentlemen the idea. I know that chick flicks may not thrill all of you, but watching the, the Hallmark Channel through the holidays and a lot of romantic, uh, feel-good, home-style movies is, is really a good thing. In one of the movies that we watched, there was a young lady that was given a locket by her mother. And on the outside of this locket, there was carved an image of the North Star. And her mother said to her, even when she was a child, as long as you have the North Star, you will never be lost. Pointing people to the North Star, sailors have navigated and circumvent or circumnavigated the globe on the oceans by using the stars. Polaris, or the North Star, is not the brightest star in the sky. Actually, it's the 50th brightest star. It's sitting there at the very end of the handle of the Little Dipper, if you can find that in the night sky, or directly from the outside portion of the Big Dipper. It's lined up there. The North Star is lined up above the axis. If we were to draw a line going through the North Pole down through the center of the globe, we would have the North Star up above. And so it gives a true direction when located in the sky of where Due north is from anywhere around the world. 
and therefore it helps people to find their place. When it comes to the Bible, we want to point to the North Star. The psalmist said, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. John recorded that Jesus prayed, sanctify them through your truth. Your word is truth. We recognize that that's what God has given us to guide us. God's word reveals God's will. It declares to us what God wants, what his longing for us is to be with him forever. It defines things like sin and love. And if you and I were left to our own definitions of sin, it would be anything that doesn't tempt me would be something that's a sin. It would be your problems, not mine, if I were defining it. And love would be whatever serves me, not necessarily you. But you see, the Bible definition of love is what is highest and best, that which brings honor and glory to God. That's what love is. So it helps us with that. If you look at restoring the North Star, every Christian in every congregation needs to answer the question, who are we? Who are we? In 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, Paul said, or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, whom you have in you, who was given to you by God. And you are not your own, for you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. When we recognize that that is what God intended, that our identity is found in Him. According to Acts 20, 28, in speaking about elders taking heed to themselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit, he said, has made you overseers, all right, to take care of, to feed the flock, which he purchased with his own blood. Understand, we've been bought at a price. And that principle in Colossians 3.17 that says, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we recognize this. Peter and John were told to stop preaching in the name of Jesus. Did they stop? No. In Acts 4.18 and Acts 5.28, they were specifically, they were strictly told or commanded to stop speaking in that name. But guess what? They did not stop. And what we see is that they continued to make sure that everyone knew. What Luke records in Acts 5.29, they said, we must obey God rather than men. You see, in restoring the North Star, what we are saying to people is that God's word is greater than any teaching or tradition of man. Those things have cropped or creeped into the church over the years. And we must recognize that that is not what God wanted us to have. And therefore, God has given us that. What we recognize is that when we look at, again, the temptation or the tendency of man, is that the principle is that man drifts away from God. In fact, there we see in Judges 21-25, it says, And there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. I want you to think with me about an Old Testament example. All right, King David and the Ark of the Covenant. If you have your Bibles, we'll get over to 1 Chronicles 15 in just a moment. But start with me back in 2 Samuel chapter 6. 2 Samuel chapter 6. I just want to read a part of this passage uh, as we think about this Old Testament example. Many times we look at this particular example and we don't go to 1 Chronicles chapter 15 to see the rest of the story. In 1 Samuel chapter 4, let me give you the background. The children of Israel had taken the Ark of the Covenant. Now the Ark of the Covenant was the only piece of furniture in the inner sanctuary of the tabernacle, the most holy place. It was a box of acacia wood that was made about 45 inches long, about 27 inches wide and 27 inches high. It had a lid, a seat that was called the mercy seat. It was made of pure gold. There were cherubim that were fashioned in, in gold on either end. And on each of the corners there were gold rings. 
intended so a pole could be placed through those rings and the Ark of the Covenant could be carried in the travels of the children of Israel or as its place in the tabernacle needed to be moved from time to time. In 1 Samuel chapter 3, the children of Israel thought, well, since the Ark of the Covenant represents the presence of God, what better thing to carry out into battle than the Ark of the Covenant? That's like a good luck charm. It's going to bring us victory. They carry the Ark of the Covenant out against the Philistines and 30,000 Israelites died that day in the battle. The Philistines captured the Ark. They take it to one of their cities. They encounter for the next several months plagues, tumors, rats. And the Philistines finally kind of scratched their head and they said, why are we inflicting this on ourselves? Let's give this box back to the Israelites. It's not doing us any good. And so they give it back to the Israelites. And according to 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 1 and 2, it sits at Abinadab's house for the next 20 years. Well, finally, in 2 Samuel chapter 6, David says as king, we need that Ark of the Covenant back in the tabernacle where it belongs. So here in 2 Samuel 6, look beginning in verse 3 as David has the desire to bring the Ark of the Covenant back into the house of God. So they set the Ark of God on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill, and Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, drove the new cart. And they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill, accompanying the Ark of God. And Ahio went before the Ark. <clears throat> then David and all the house of Israel played music before the Lord on all kinds of instruments of fir wood, on harps, on stringed instruments, on tambourines, on sistrums, and on cymbals. When they came to Nachon's threshing floor, Uzzah put out his hand to the Ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen stumbled. Then the anger of the Lord was aroused against Uzzah, and God struck him there for his error, and he died there by the Ark of God. And David became angry because of the Lord's outbreak against Uzzah, and he called the name of the place Perez Uzzah to this day. David was afraid of the Lord that day, and he said, How can the ark of the Lord come to me? So David would not move the ark of the Lord with him into the city of David, but David took it aside into the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. Now if you look at this story, David does a good job because he doesn't send two men in a truck to go get the ark. But what they did was they put it on a new cart. It wasn't anything that had been used for any other purpose. It was something that was pristine. But yet, it wasn't what God instructed. What David learns is he's got to respect the way that God says that things should be done. I want you to look with me in 1 Corinthians 15 and notice... The other part of this story, in Second or First Chronicles 15, what we see in verse 2 is David has learned something. He says, no one may carry the Ark of the Covenant but the Levites, for the Lord has chosen them to carry the Ark of God and to minister before Him forever. You know, if they had taken time to go back and read in Numbers chapter 4, and there's some instructions there about the ark, but particularly in Numbers 4 and verse 15, it says if anybody touches the ark, you know what it says is going to happen? They're going to die. If Uzzah was familiar with Numbers 4 15, he wouldn't have touched it. If the people, if David was familiar with God's proper order, what we see is that David would not have moved it that way. What went wrong? What David is trying to find out and what is explained in 1 Chronicles 15 is what went wrong before in 2 Samuel chapter 6 is they didn't follow. Look with me at verse 13. For because you did not do it the first time, the Lord our God broke out against us because we did not consult him about the proper order. When God has spoken, God must be obeyed. The proper order is to do God's things in God's way or what we say is we do Bible things in Bible ways and we call them by Bible names. Sounds pretty simple, doesn't it? 
Sounds like it's a good way of avoiding any kind of conflict. What we see clearly is essentially here that the standard is made very clear. David says when we consult God, we do what he says. And notice there in verse 15, the phrase that was read for us by J. Ray. As Moses had commanded according to the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord means something. If we're going to restore the north star, it's because the word of God is our north star. It's because the word of God gives us our direction. It gives us our identity. It gives us our vision. It places us on the right path all the way to the destination. Is your destination heaven? You know, if that's where you want your destination, then who's going to set you on the right course? The difficulty is man tends to drift away from God. Man tends to take it upon ourselves to be able to do things the way that we think it's to be done or the way that suits us or, or the way that makes us enjoy it more, the way that we like it. But doing it God's way brings the reward if we understand. There are two things in the Protestant Reformation that came out that, that are really key. And one of them was sola scriptura, that is scripture alone. When we look at this example back in the Old Testament, we see that's a pretty good concept to follow. The scripture alone. The second thing was what we call the regulative principle. And that is we do the things that God prescribes. And if God gives us a specific way of doing things, we follow those specific commands specifically. We do what God's prescribed. We don't take the philosophy and say, well, God didn't say not to. Can I ask you a question? If we took that philosophy, well, so-and-so didn't say not to do something, would you act that way in your marriage? I hope not. Would you act that way as parents? Would you say well, to your kids, well, you can do anything that I didn't specifically tell you not to do. Oh, Lord, help us. The world's got enough problems without us doing that. You wouldn't do or act that way at work. And certainly if we had courts of law that operated that way, we would have all kinds of confusion in our society. I want you to look with me at the restoration principle and what God says because there is a principle. That is, there is a principle that is essential for all generations. In 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 11, Peter writes, if any man speaks, let him speak as of the oracles of God. In other words, if I'm going to speak as God speaks, I'm going to speak what God has spoken. This is why we want to be able to quote book, chapter, and verse for the things that we are following, the things that we are teaching. This is exactly what we see that God wants us to do, and this is the pattern that we see in the New Testament. Sometimes people say, well, are you sure there's a pattern? In 1 Corinthians 14, Paul says this, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. That confusion is the idea of arguments, strife, division. God wants peace. Again, if we were to look out among this audience this morning, and we were to try to figure out how many different ways that we like things. If there's 320 people, as the board says, what I would say is there's probably close to 320 different ways of doing some things. All of us would have our own ideas. Would that be confusion? Oh, yeah. That would be terribly confusing. But God is not the author of confusion. God wants us to have peace. So he's given us a pattern. If you look... In Jude verse 3, take your Bibles and turn back to the next to last book in the New Testament. And there Jude writes about why he was even penning this particular letter, this epistle. So what he tells them in Jude in verse 3 is, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints. Common salvation. That word common means something that is shared, something in which everyone has a like. Salvation, according to the New Testament, comes 
in the very way that God has prescribed, the very way the New Testament teaches. And we understand that's what means that, that those who have followed those simple commands have that in common. They share that in their obedience to God. In putting their faith, their trust in Christ, they have obeyed that common salvation. The faith is, understand, is something that is the once for all delivered, the body of truth, the doctrine that God wants us to have and to trust and believe in. All scripture is given by the inspiration of God, is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, righteousness, that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped to every good work. Look with me at 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 and 2. We talk about this pattern. Sometimes people will say, well, there's not a pattern. Can I ask you a question? Have you ever been with any religious group or heard of any religious group that didn't take up some sort of a collection? It seems one thing that all religious groups have in common is they need money. And they are good at making sure they pass the plate or the hat or basket, whatever it is, to collect it. Listen to what Paul says about this practice, this command, this pattern in 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also. On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. If I can say that there is harmony over one of God's commands, it would probably be this one. This is one thing which everybody gets. And they do this as a matter of very strong pattern religious practice. Look at the next in Acts chapter 20. And John read this earlier, thankfully, at the, uh, at the observance of our uh, Lord's Supper. But in Acts 20, verses 6 and 7... It says that Paul arrived at Troas, and it says at the end of the verse where we stayed seven days. Now on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break the bread, it says Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. Now I do have a pattern here to preach till midnight, but don't get nervous. We're, we're getting close. Understand that when a preacher says you're getting close, it doesn't mean it's over. Okay, I don't want, to, I don't want anybody to, you know. You said we were almost done. No. Understand something. Paul waited seven days to be able to meet with them. On the first day of the week, they came together, and the express purpose, that is the, the, the language here, is to break the bread or to observe the Lord's Supper, the bread and the fruit of the vine, just like we did this morning. They did as they assembled on that occasion in Troas. Now, I ask you a question. Was this an unplanned coincidence or was this a planned pattern? And I would tell you that it was a planned pattern because Paul waited specifically so that he could have this opportunity to worship with them, to be able to speak to them, to be able to preach and exhort to them. What we have repeatedly in the New Testament are instructions about our assemblies. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, Paul gives a number of those. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, Paul gives some more instructions. Understand there is a pattern for us. Secondly, there is a purpose. There is a purpose behind this pattern. If you have your Bibles, turn to John chapter 17. What is truly the Lord's Prayer as Jesus was closing out before they were going to the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus speaks to his disciples and in his prayer to the Father in front of them, specifically in their ears, Jesus prays in John 17, 20 and 21, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me. And I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 10 through 13, Paul talks about them speaking the same thing and being of the same mind and of the same judgment. They're not being divided by different names. Sometimes people will ask, are you Protestant? Are you evangelical? Are you denominational? Are you non-denominational? Are you undenominational? 
Are you anti-denominational? I mean, there's a bunch of different questions that we get asked. And understand, we'll try to answer some of those over the next few weeks, but what I want you to understand is that what we have in Scripture, in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 13 to 16, Paul says, till we all come in the unity of the faith. And specifically, he says there in verse 14, that we no longer be like children who are tossed about to and fro with every wind of doctrine. Every teaching that comes along, folks, is not equal. And if it's not biblical, it's not from God. And therefore, it must be rejected because it is not God's teaching. Restoring the North Star means that what we do is we get back to the Bible. We get back to God's Word and we say, we want the authority for whatever we believe, whatever we teach, whatever we practice, to be firmly, clearly from God's Word. And so this is what Paul makes clear there in 1 Corinthians 1, 10 through 13. He tells them, don't call yourselves after Paul or Peter or Apollos because the only one who died for you is Jesus Christ. The only one in whose name you were baptized is Jesus Christ. The only one who is our Savior and Lord is Jesus Christ. And therefore, there is a principle to keep. This restoring the North Star, this res restoration concept, means that we get back to Colossians 3.17. I quoted it earlier. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I've said it before, that doesn't mean if I open up a door for, for my wife, Gwen, it doesn't mean I have to say, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I open this door. I can tell you she would get a little bit tired of hearing that. And I can tell you that at other public places with people from, from the community, they might be bothered by that. But understand, the way we live is our identity, our belonging is completely placed under the lordship of Jesus Christ. To do all in the name of the, lead, the Lord Jesus Christ means that whatever I believe is right or wrong, whatever I believe is something worthy to express and espouse to others is because it respects Jesus Christ. In Ephesians 3.21, Paul would say, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations. To him be glory. Whatever we do in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ brings glory to God. Why is it that this has been such a problem? You know, Why is it that this is not something that is more evident? You know, It's because the tendency is for man to drift away. The tendency is for man to do certain things because of pride. The Bible says there's a way that seems right to man, but the end is death. Jeremiah would say in Jeremiah 10, 23, It's not in man who walks to direct his own steps. Folks, we need a North Star. We need someone to guide us. And the only way that we can walk together, the only way we can be agreed, the only way we can have unity is if we respect that North Star of God's Word. God's Word leads us all the way that He wants us to be, all the way that He wants us to find. So we study to show ourselves to approve to God. A worker not ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of truth, following that all scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That's how we can be approved. We need to get back to this principle. If you and I are left on our own, would we be able to find that direction? Would we be able to achieve that unity? Would we be able to go all the way to the gates of heaven, to be able to hear that phrase that I long to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things, enter into the joys of your master. To be able to go through the gates of heaven to spend eternity is something that absolutely blesses us. To be able to restore that North Star in every aspect of our lives. A number of years ago, there was a, a battle and the cavalry was riding into that battle, and they were greatly outnumbered. But they were faithful to their duty, and so they were in their charge. And there was one rider who was carrying proudly the American flag. He was shot. He fell off of his horse. But even on the ground, he propped himself up, and he held up the American flag as high as he could. 
until another rider, almost like a track meet passing a baton, came by and grabbed that flag and raised it once again as the banner. Folks, our banner is the Word of God. Our flag that we fly as far as being able to serve and live as God's people is because we've restored that North Star to want to be and to strive to be according to what God has said through His Word at all times. This morning, maybe you don't have that common salvation. Maybe you've never obeyed the gospel as it's recorded in the New Testament. Jesus told His disciples to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every person. And He said, He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. If you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, you repent of your sins, and you want to be buried with Him in the waters of immersion today, we would rejoice. The angels in heaven will rejoice over even one sinner who repents from the error of their way. This morning, is as, if as a child of God, you realize that you've lost your way and you need to restore that North Star, you need to get back to that restoration principle of getting back to the Bible and letting God lead you in all areas of your life. We encourage you, make that confession this morning. If, your need, if you have any need, just step to the front. Let us assist you this morning, right now, while we stand and while we sing.